Well, that neatly segues into our next um, sort of argument then, which is, of course, the fine tuning of the universe for life. Um, again, if you could, in layman friendly terms, sketch out what this particular phenomenon is and, and again, how it's changed our understanding of the universe and our place in it in the last several decades. Sure. I mean, it's a little easier to stand, understand than quantum cosmology. So I'll try, I'll try to do better than my last answer. Sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, Hoyle is actually one of the, the first, maybe the first physicist who, who stumbles across this phenomenon of the fine tuning. He's thinking about the importance of carbon and some of the other heavier elements, but it's in particular carbon. Carbon has unique properties, forms long chain like molecules that can store information. It's critical to all biological life that we know. And he's trying to think, how can we get the, how can we explain the abundance of carbon? And he, he for the life of him, can't really come up with a solution. He knows the atomic weight. So he's trying to think of how it can be built up from smaller elements. And he ends up coming up with an idea that if you combine beryllium, uh, beryllium atom with a helium atom, that that would form a carbon-12. But he realized that the, the energy level of that molecule, the, what's called the resonance, would be higher than what normal carbon has. And so he's wondering if that resonance level exists. He goes out to Caltech. He gets some guys to run some experiments there. And lo and behold, the resonance level that he predicted on purely theoretical cosmological grounds turns out to exist. And that's that's a kind of fine tuning in itself, but it's actually the tip of an iceberg of a whole series of other fine tuning parameters. And what fine tuning is, is, is if you could think of it as a sort of a Goldilocks zone that we live in a Goldilocks universe where there are all these fundamental parameters that are not too heavy, you know, the atomic weights of things are not too heavy, not too light, the speed of light, not too fast, not too slow, the expansion rate of the universe, same, not too fast, not too slow. Um, and everything is is just right to allow for the possibility of life, that with multiple different parameters, if things fall outside very narrow ranges or tolerances, then life for various reasons would not be possible. In fact, even stable galaxies, planetary systems, and in, in, and for many of the fine-tuning parameters, even atoms heavier than helium would not be possible. And so you have this kind of stunning recognition. And, and this hits Hoyle and other physicists at a really fundamental level because they understand how fundamental these parameters are to the universe we live in. And yet, in opposition to their expectation, the, the 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 conditions that are necessary for life to exist are not common. They're not easy to, to, to produce. They're extremely improbable. And they, they fall within narrow ranges among very much, 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 much wider possible ranges or natural ranges, as they put it. And so Hoyle ends up shifting his point of view on, on the big metaphysical questions from his staunch atheism to a kind of quasi-theism and is quoted as saying, physics and chemistry look as if they've been monkeyed with, he says, and and uh, to make life possible. And so he ends up uh, writing about this and, and, and having a major shift in worldview. Many other physicists end up adopting the same perspective. Uh, the great uh, physicist at Cambridge University, John Polkinghorne, who was um, late in life, also uh, involved, took on holy orders and was became part of the Anglican Church, who was a spokesman for the science, science and faith issues. He was a, a very a, a capable advocate of this fine-tuning argument, that fine-tuning suggests a fine-tuner. And so that's been, a, that's been a big shift. And there have been more and more of these fine-tuning parameters discovered in, in recent years. Uh, the young physicist Luke Barnes, who did his PhD at Cambridge, uh, did a, a joint book with his PhD supervisor called The Fortunate Universe. Supervisor was an atheist, Barnes is a theist. They they describe the fine tuning parameters that are known, and list at the end of the book all the different physicists who accept that fine tuning is a real phenomenon that needs to be explained. And then they have a dialogue between them, the two of them about how best to explain them the fine tuning. Barnes argues for theistic design, and his uh, supervisor uh, poses other explanations. One of the most popular right now is something called the multiverse, which we can, which we can talk mm. about as well. Well, well let, let's, let, before we get to the multiverse, um, you know, let's deal with maybe a few common objections to this, um, sometimes philosophical objections of one sort or another. Um, th th perhaps uh, 
at one level, you've got the Douglas Adams sort of uh, objection, which is, well, um, life is rather like, you know, claiming that life is fine tuned for the universe is a bit like saying that this um, puddle is fine tuned for the shape of the water in it. Um, the point being that if you like the 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 when the puddle says look, look how perfectly formed i am to contain this water is obviously just happens to be it just the water fills the available space and takes the shape it does and i think people kind of make a similar argument for life look uh you know life will find a way there there is a sort of sense in which you know um it's it's arrogant for us to claim that we we were always the intended outcome of this universe it could have been something different some a different sort of set of circumstances might have produced some completely different life form who knows um what what do you say to that kind of an objection right well i've had exactly that uh, an argument about exactly that ob objection with uh, lawrence krauss and the journal inference and krauss's way of putting it is very crisp he says that um uh life didn't um uh, life isn't possible because there was pre-existing fine-tuning Rather, life evolved in accord with the fine-tuning parameters that had been pre-established. And so there's nothing special about life. Uh, the fine-tuning was, uh, the li li life simply took advantage of and evolved in, 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 the, in accord with the universe that was produced by the fine-tuning parameters. The problem with that is that you don't get, with many of the fine-tuning parameters, you can't get stable galaxies. You can't get planetary systems. You can't get even. You can't even get atoms heavier than helium. That the fine tuning is necessary, a necessary condition of there being any subsequent evolution at all. So, the, in other words, the fine tuning is more primary, more prior. It's, it's prior to any even possible evolutionary process. So you can't say that. Well, of course, evolution uh, accommodated what was was present. There wouldn't be anything. Uh, present to make evolution possible if it weren't for the fine tuning. It's it's that primary and that fundamental. Mm. The, yeah, the, you don't the, you don't have chemistry full stop to be able to mess with right, uh, right, if you exactly, don't have the fine tuning exactly. to enable uh, atoms and you know. And, and, heavy, and there are multiple yeah. types of fine tuning. There's the fine tuning of the of the laws and constants of physics, but and there's the fine tuning of the planetary system, but then even at a very a, very fundamental level, there's the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe, sometimes called the initial entropy fine-tuning, which is the arrangement of mass energy in the initial plasma state of the universe. Turns out that it's exquisitely finely tuned. This is the number that Roger Penrose, uh, the calculation that he's made, that it's hyper-exponentially fine-tuned, one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123. So you, you've got stuff that's set from the very beginning that's necessary to even getting basic chemistry off the ground. So uh, I don't think that objection works. I think it, it's facile in, in, in a way. Sounds to it's like the old Abraham Lincoln thing about, isn't it great that the man's legs are just long enough to reach the ground? But no, that, that, that's, not, that's funny because the law of gravity is actually what we would say is responsible for that. But the law of gravity is finely tuned to make carbon and, and other things are finely tuned even to make more simple molecule or atoms. So I think, that's the, that's the I think there's a decisive response to that objection. Yeah, I mean that that number from Penrose one in whatever it was ten to the ten to the one two three. But the um, I heard it said that if you, you, you I mean if you put a, a zero on every single particle in the universe, you still wouldn't have a number big enough. I mean it's it's a, a extraordinarily. I mean it, it it even even to call it fine tuning doesn't do it justice really. But anyway. Um, Okay, let's talk about um just one, one more uh, riff on that. Yeah, got please. Cosmological constant, you know, which is the the degree of fine tuning of the force that's re causing the expansion of the universe. That's accepted at about one part in ten to the ninety, I think, is an accepted, uh, you know, uh, and so that would be, and, and that if that's off, then you get a recollapse of the universe, and no no evolution is possible at that point. If or you get a heat death. Okay, if it's off in either direction. And just to put that in perspective, there's 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the universe by many estimates. So getting that the the, the cosmological constant fine tuning right would be equivalent to the odds of a blindfolded person floating in free space trying to find one marked elementary particle, but having to search not just one universe, not just our universe, but 10 billion our size. So 
it, the, the degree of fine tuning with some of these parameters is beyond exquisite. We just we simply don't have uh, uh, modifiers and adjectives to to capture this. So, what one other quick objection before we get to the big one, the the multiverse. Yes, yeah, um, the, the this is multiverse. Yeah, <laughs> this is again a sort of a philosophical objection, um, which just says, well, look, of course it's unsurprising that we live in a fine tuned universe because we're here to observe it. We wouldn't be observing a fine tuned universe if it wasn't fine tuned for us to be able to be here. Um, what what do you make of that particular? Objection? Well, there's two different versions of that. There's one thing, one called the weak anthropic principle and the strong anthropic principle. I deal with both in the book. The strong anthro anthropic principle trades on the old uh, kind of sophomore philosophical uh, uh, saw: if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, did it make a sound? And the idea is that that the, you really couldn't have a universe unless there was someone there to observe it. And since um, uh, and there, therefore the universe had to be finely tuned at the beginning, so it would evolve to produce uh, uh, observers long after the fact, and that's the strong anthropic principle. The obvious problem with that is that if the observers are the ultimate cause of the universe, then the observers are, are evolving after the universe has evolved to produce them. So you've got the cause after the alleged effect that the cause explains, which is, I think, simply irrational because <laughs> cause and effect don't work that way. It's the cause precedes the effect. Uh, the weak anthropic principle is a little more subtle. Um, you, you may remember also that Martin Gardner, the former editor of, uh, I think, Scientific American, he, was, he, he talked about the, all the different anthropic principles. And when he got to the strong anthropic principle, he, he said that he, he called that not the SAP for strong anthropic principle. He called it the, the completely ridiculous anthropic principle <laughs> and uh, gave it the name crap. So, um, the weak anthropic principle is a little more subtle. It says that, that um, uh, yeah, we shouldn't be surprised because, uh, of course, we live in a universe that is consistent with prior conditions that are consistent with our existence. If we didn't, we wouldn't be here. It doesn't make the observers the cause. It just says we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, problem with that, though, is that it, it still doesn't explain the origin of the fine-tuning. It explains, um, it, it, it cites a necessary condition of our existence, that is the fine-tuning parameters are necessary for us to exist, without explaining what caused the fine-tuning parameters themselves. So there's a logical dis confusion between necessary condition and cause. Those aren't the same thing. And it also explains the wrong thing. We're not trying to explain our surprise or lack thereof of being here, or even why we are here, given that there is fine-tuning, rather we're trying to explain how the fine-tuning came to be. And there, the design hypothesis provides a causal explanation. We're simply saying, hey, we're not surprised, we shouldn't be surprised, provides no such causal explanation.